Welcome everyone to our live webinar tonight, the Goodfellow Unit. We're talking about inflammatory bowel disease with Dr. Alastair Patrick. Dr. Thank Patrick you. is a gastroenterologist and general physician. He's the head of department at Middlemore Hospital and the head of the bowel screening program at Counties Manukau District Health Board. And he's also the director of the McMurray Centre. Welcome, Alastair. Thank you very much. For those who haven't done this before, um, for this session, we, we love to have your live questions. If you don't know how to do the questions, you click on the orange arrow and type in the question. It sends through to us and we'll endeavour to answer as many as we can and get through them all in the session if we if possible. Alastair, I'll pass it on to you. Thank you very much. It's a privilege to um, here, be here talking to you guys. Um, I'll go through some background uh, information about inflammatory bowel disease and then, as Helen said, we'll try and get into some questions because I think uh, it's probably going to be much more interesting than having you guys listen to me uh, for an hour and a quarter. Right, so I'm going to start by um, discussing what uh, inflammatory bowel disease is and then talk a bit about the um, clinical course of both uh, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis because I think as GPs it's it's probably a good uh, thing to have a bit of an overview of um, what's likely to happen through the um, uh, through the course of the disease and what you might expect when you see your patient uh, at different points along their um, journey through their uh, through their illness. Uh, we'll talk about the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease and I'll try and uh, focus on things that are a bit more relevant for um, general practice. Uh, then novel treatments of inflammatory bowel disease are always an area of interest. Um, so we'll get onto that and then uh, finish off with um, some practical uh, case uh, questions at the end. So this is what the large intestine uh, looks like. You can see uh, in this histological uh, view here, it's split between mucosa, submucosa, and then the um, muscle layer there, and then the serosa on the outside. And I put this up because um, there is a difference between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, and it's good to have a, a view of what that looks like in your mind. So what is the cause uh, of inflammatory bowel disease? It's actually something that uh, has not been fully elucidated. Uh, there are a number of causative agents that are suspected to be important uh, in the development of these conditions, including certain bacteria, uh, viruses, uh, dietary intake, including um, you know, a number of things that have been thought to be a possible cause, but really nothing has been uh, determined to be um, the definite cause of this. Like most things, though, there's probably an interaction between the environment uh, and your genetic factors. Uh, and then also some reaction between the luminal factors such as the bacteria, and that's where these things like uh, fecal transplants come from and, and perhaps different antibiotics and probiotics that might be useful uh, in the future for treating uh, these inflammatory conditions. And so the role of the bacteria is something that is being investigated uh, quite extensively at the moment around the world. Uh, so down the bottom of that picture there, you've got uh, the activation of the T cells, and it's mainly a, a Th1 uh, response, which leads from that immune overaction uh, to inflammation and then tissue injury. So ulcerative colitis um, is a condition which causes mucosal ulceration in the colon, uh, whereas Crohn's disease can affect the rest of the GI tract. Uh, and it can be uh, found in different parts of the GI tract. We call disease that's just in the end of the small bowel ileitis. Uh, we still call it colitis. So Crohn's colitis is Crohn's disease that affects uh, the colon. Um, and so you can have only uh, colonic disease in Crohn's as well. The difference between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's is that ulcerative colitis starts uh, at the rectum uh, and spreads north, whereas Crohn's disease uh, typically has skip lesions. Um, and so that's one way to tell uh, if the disease is apart. And then you can have a mixture of uh, upper and lower GI tract um, disease called ileocolitis. There's also another group um, called indeterminate colitis, and approximately 10% of the time it's difficult to tell even on uh, lots of histological specimens or looking at the um, clinical picture, whether a patient truly has Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. And very occasionally, uh, patients even go for a colectomy for ulcerative colitis, uh, and later on we find it's Crohn's. Unfortunately, that's pretty uncommon with uh, techniques such as pill cam and things to image the small bowel, because if you see any ulceration or inflammation in the small bowel, uh, then you know that uh, it's got to be Crohn's and it can't be uh, ulcerative colitis. Um, on the right of this picture here, there's a, a number of uh, things that I just wanted to point out. Smoking is a very uh, important thing to be aware of in your patients who have both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Crohn's is um, made worse by smoking, uh, and even um, uh, smoking any cigarettes makes a big difference to the outcome in Crohn's and how effective our medication is. 
And I've had patients uh, that we've treated with uh, very you know, hard core medications and they do badly and you stop them smoking and they, they actually uh, suddenly start to do much better. And so it does make a real difference. So it's a key thing to always ask about uh, in patients with Crohn's if, if they are still smoking uh, and trying to help them uh, to quit because it will make a big difference to their outcome. Uh, Anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, we always try and get patients to avoid uh, if they can. Um, <clears throat> and then things such as stress, et cetera, it's a bit uh, less clear exactly uh, what role uh, that has in the disease. So how common is inflammatory bowel disease in New Zealand? Well, this is uh, from Richard Gary, who's a, a gastroenterologist down in Christchurch, who uh, has published a lot of data uh, on uh, inflammatory bowel disease in New Zealand. And he uh, has come up with this rate of about 300 per 100,000. So if you think about how many patients are in your practice, uh, there's probably quite a few um, that you've got with Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, and you may not yet know that that's what they've got. So it's approximately 13,800 patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And it's about uh, two Crohn's disease patients to one ulcerative colitis uh, patient in New Zealand. They're more likely to be female, uh, younger, and more common in uh, Caucasians. Now, I get a bit of a, a um, biased view, I guess, on that regard because I work out at Middlemore and we actually see a lot of uh, Crohn's in, um, in the Indian population and in the Fijian Indian population. So certainly uh, don't rule it out in other ethnicities, bearing in mind that this study was done in Christchurch, so maybe a little bit biased towards um, the number of Caucasians that they found with the disease. And about somewhere around 10 to 20 percent of patients have uh, some sort of family history. And so obviously that's the minority. So a lot of patients, it really does come out of the blue. Uh, without a clear uh, family uh, history in the background. What are the clinical features uh, of these uh, two conditions? So ulcerative colitis, we'll start with uh, in that uh, column there on the left. Uh, the patient often has um, bloody diarrhoea. That's because it affects the very bottom end, so they almost always pass blood. Um, its endoscopic picture is that of diffuse uh, superficial inflammation. So that first slide that I showed you with the layers of the colon, uh, ulcerative colitis only affects the superficial layers of the bowel, so just uh, the mucosa, and it doesn't affect right through. And that's why with ulcerative colitis we don't see things such as fistulas, uh, because it's not a condition that erodes deeply into the uh, wall of the bowel, so it has quite a, a different sort of longer term risk uh, profile uh, for complications as opposed to Crohn's disease. Um, the serological markers uh, are not overly uh, helpful, I guess, but we do sometimes check anchors. Uh, so that's a P anchor. Um, if we're trying to determine if someone's got ulcerative colitis versus Crohn's, um, whereas the ASCA uh, is something useful, uh, if that's positive, then the person uh, is more likely to have Crohn's disease. But again, that's not uh, particularly specific. Uh, so Crohn's can present with a number of, um, in a number of different ways, really depending on where in the GI tract it affects. Uh, if it affects low down in the colon, you will get diarrhea. Otherwise, you might get pain, uh, perianal uh, symptoms. Uh, so there's a number of different uh, ways that uh, Crohn's can present. Quite a few patients with uh, small bowel Crohn's uh, don't get diarrhoea, so uh, it's certainly not something that um, you hang your hat on. If they haven't got diarrhoea, you, you don't necessarily write inflammatory bowel disease off uh, from your differential diagnosis. When we look with an endoscope, uh, as I've mentioned, you get patchy disease, uh, and you can get very deep uh, fissures because of the uh, deep invasion uh, through the wall. And the one thing we look for on the uh, pathological specimens is something called a granuloma, uh, which is a, a type of inflammatory reaction, which we only see in Crohn's and not ulcerative colitis. And that really clinches the diagnosis of Crohn's, uh, but we only see that in about one in five uh, patients. In this box um, on the right there, I've got some of the non-bowel manifestations. Uh, a lot of patients, of course, have fatigue and weight loss and some non-specific symptoms like that. But I think the things that um, should alert you to looking a bit harder and perhaps you're a young woman who presents with a bit of abdominal pain and a bit of diarrhea and you think well is this irritable bowel or not is to think about these extra intestinal manifestations of inflammatory bowel disease such as the arthritis and arthralgias, um, eye disease, uh, iritis, uveitis, uh, skin diseases, erythematodosum which is uh, painful lumps on the shins, uh, they can get liver disease associated with um, inflammatory bowel disease, so you might see mildly deranged liver tests and obstructive pattern if they've got PSC. Um, and then there's a number of other uh, things that I've listed there that you can see with uh, patients with inflammatory bowel disease. So what happens over time? Well, this is an old uh, slide, um, but it's still, I think, useful. And it shows that what you see at the beginning of the course of Crohn's disease is not 
um, what you see throughout the, the history for the patient. Um, and in fact, we've learned a lot from the rheumatologists and the way that they manage uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So with rheumatoid arthritis, historically, you'd see your patients you know, with lots of deformities in their hands and things. Um, whereas what the rheumatologists now do is they treat aggressively early on in the course of uh, rheumatoid arthritis and try and you know get rid of that inflammation and so you don't see the the damage accumulating over many many years and and the um, elderly patients with all of those uh, deformities and it's a similar sort of picture in my mind now with Crohn's disease the patients do start off with a lot of inflammation early in their uh, course and what happens over time is the inflammation does slowly go down and you're left with the residual damage that the inflammation has caused such as stricturing uh, and then penetration and so the longer the disease has gone on uh, the more likely you are to end up with uh, those complications which of course can be devastating to the patient's uh, quality of life and so we've really started to treat patients much more aggressively early on to try and uh, avoid this uh, this is a slide showing a score which um, i don't, obviously don't uh, want you guys to to know too much about except this the concept of this accumulation of uh, damage that occurs and so with the, um, the graph that you can see there, there's the spikes running along the bottom from the disease onset and then finally the diagnosis. And this is through the person's uh, life where they're getting intermittent flares of the disease, uh, which settle down nearly to baseline, but often not quite to baseline. And then you've got that digestive damage that's slowly accumulating over time, the strictures, the abscesses. You know, they might need a surgery where, you know, suddenly they have a big bit of their bowel taken out, uh, which again, you know, is something that we, we try and avoid. So it's an interesting concept to have in your mind of how we um, now treat patients with Crohn's disease. Uh, what about um, ulcerative colitis? Well, uh, uh, ulcerative colitis can um, uh, can have quite a varied clinical course. So that first curve there, we see in about 55% of patients. Um, this is a study uh, from Norway where they followed patients over, over five years and tried to put them into a pattern uh, and so the commonest curve is that first curve where uh, they have a big flare right at the beginning of their disease and then they actually grumble along, but not too bad uh, over time. Um, the fourth curve there with flare followed by a bit of remission, followed by flare, followed by remission, we see in about a third of patients. So the two biggest groups are that first group and that fourth group. The other two curves uh, we see much less often, uh, but you can have patients who, you know, by like curve three there where they get uh, a big flare, but they never really get over it, and they get, you know, flares that just seem to keep coming. Uh, and I guess a lot of those patients, you know, are ones that are going to be in tertiary care because they're probably going to be quite uh, unwell with with that pattern of disease. Ulcerative colitis can also affect uh, different in different distributions. Um, and the reason I put this up is it does make a difference to how we treat these patients. If a patient's got proctitis, uh, or perhaps a little bit further north than the rectum. Uh, then we'd be more likely to treat them with, with enemas and things as opposed to treat them with systemic uh, therapy. And the more extensive the colitis, then um, the higher the risk of bowel cancer. And so things such as screening after eight years, uh, we would start in those patients who have extensive colitis or pancolitis, whereas the risk if the person has proctitis is actually very low. And generally, we wouldn't screen these patients, particularly if the disease was well controlled. These are some uh, beautiful endoscopic images I'm sure you guys will enjoy uh, probably having your dinner. Um, just showing normal on the left there and the accumulation really uh, through through to severe on the right, which is a big ulceration and inflammation with, with bleeding. This is the cumulative colectomy rate in uh, ulcerative colitis historically. Uh, this is from that same, same Norwegian study. And you can see at about 10 years, about 10% of patients ended up with a colectomy uh, in, that, um, in that group. So I guess that's an interesting figure to have in your mind, perhaps when you see a young person who's being first diagnosed with ulcerative colitis in your practice. So what about um, management? Well, I think there are certain goals um, with management. And um, in primary care, you probably are going to be seeing acute uh, flares. And one of the first things we're always trying to do is think about reducing that intestinal inflammation um, and, if possible, getting mucosal healing. Um, we know from good longer-term data now that if you've got a patient who uh, has Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, their life expectancy uh, is, in fact, normal. Uh, the only thing that drops the life expectancy is if patients have had prolonged or recurrent attacks, of, uh, recurrent uh, courses of steroids. So corticosteroids, you know, and the side effects of corticosteroids 
have a um, big effect on the risks of diabetes and heart disease, etc. So, you know, it's it's really important that if you've got a patient who is having recurrent um, flares and re requiring current courses of prednisone, uh, that those people need to be referred and some thought needs to go into, you know, trying to put them on an appropriate management. And that may even include surgery uh, to try and uh, reduce their requirements for these recurrent um, bouts of steroids that they will require over, over many years. Uh, and then some of the treatment is, is aimed uh, mostly at, at symptoms to control their, you know, their pain and their diarrhea, um, perhaps whilst you're getting on top of their uh, inflammation. We're trying to improve overall patients' quality of life. Uh, nutritional deficiencies are another really important um, area that I, I always think about when, when I see these patients. They've got sort of a double whammy where they've got a lot of inflammation in their gut. Um, they're not feeling particularly well, so they're usually not eating or drinking well. Um, and often they they can have uh, problems with absorption of various uh, nutrients through their gut, particularly in the Crohn's patients. And so, you know, they 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 uh, certainly are, are at risk of nutritional problems. And we always think about things like osteoporosis uh, in these patients, particularly over you know, long periods of time, particularly if they've required a lot of steroids. Um, and we're trying to prevent them ending up in hospitals. So like the rheumatologist, as I mentioned, you know, trying to treat these patients, you know, more completely get their bowel healed and try and avoid those uh, complications that we've seen historically where patients end up requiring operations. So let's just do a, a quick overview of the medical treatment. Um, five ASAs, uh, the common ones in New Zealand that you would have all heard of are Pentaza uh, and Azacol, uh, which is for mild to moderate um, disease. Um, antibiotics, there's some evidence for antibiotics, but not particularly good long-term. Um, steroids, and I'm going to go on to talk about these in a bit more detail. Um, good for getting the person under control, but absolutely no benefit uh, longer term. Uh, so keeping someone on steroids doesn't really do anything for the long-term control of their disease. Uh, so it's important to get them off. And the way we do that is by starting immunosuppressant agents such as azathioprine, 6 mercaptopurine, uh, which is a derivative of azathioprine, uh, methotrexate we sometimes use, and sometimes we use cyclosporin if the patient is unwell in the hospital to try and rescue them. But um, it'd be very rare to find a patient who's on cyclosporin long term for uh, for um, inflammatory bowel disease. And then we step up to the um, more heavy duty treatments such as infliximab, which is an infusion. Um, they have to uh, come to hospital and, and get an infusion uh, every eight weeks. Uh, and then adalimumab, which is also called Humira, which is a subcutaneous injection that they'll get every couple of weeks. And then there's a number of other ones available overseas, which uh, we don't have access to uh, currently uh, in New Zealand. So I've sort of alluded to this approach um, now uh, in this talk. You could look at a step up approach where you get a person who has uh, the first attack and and you don't necessarily know what course of disease they're going to have according to those graphs I've shown you. And giving them a 5 ASA is, is a very appropriate uh, place to start. Um, internationally, though, uh, people are more aggressive now uh, and actually start with biologics, so the so-called top-down approach, where you, know, you might, if you've got a young person who's got um, a number of risk factors you know, for severe disease, such as uh, that it's come on very young, they've got perianal disease, they've got severe disease when they first present, you know, they're a smoker. There's a number of factors that we know sort of uh, are indicative of uh, a poor prognosis. Then those patients, you know, we want to treat them quite aggressively. In New Zealand, though, I think most people still use the step up approach. Uh, in my own practice, um, I try and step up very quickly. So if a person is not responding very well to simple drugs such as uh, Pentazer or Azacol, uh, then I'll quite quickly move them on to immunomodulators and even biologics you know, as soon as possible, because you want to avoid that accumulation of damage that uh, we saw historically uh, with these with these patients. Uh, so 5 ASAs, um, there's a couple of um, formulations uh, in New Zealand. Um, Azacol, uh, which you can see in the middle there, is a, a pH dependent um, release. And so it predominantly uh, is released through the colon. And so it's probably more appropriate for uh, use in people who have ulcerative colitis or perhaps colonic um, Crohn's disease. Uh, whereas Pentaza is a, a time dependent release, and that's why the capsules are different. So if you've ever talked to your patients about taking Pentaza, um, if they dissolve it in a cup of water or even it dissolves in their mouth, it's like uh, swallowing sand because they're all tiny little microspheres. 
and patients, you know, aren't particularly fond of these big uh, tablets, which, which they have to take in uh, large doses. So most people would be on six tablets of Pentaza a day, you know, but it's a very good tablet in the sense that it can cover the whole of the gut because it's slowly releasing as it goes through the gut, as opposed to just being released uh, in the in the colon. And so we do use different formulations of five ASAs depending on uh, where the disease is. Um, uh, I think in pr in primary practice, it's useful uh, to have a, just a very quick overview of of side effects of five ASAs. Um, obviously, these things are very easily available online. Uh, if you if you ever wanted to think about is this presenting problem with this person on 5-ASAs related to the drug. Um, but I think the messages for my end here are um, just being aware that it can upset your liver tests. Um, and I do see a couple of patients a year who have quite severe hepatitis from 5-ASAs, and that does go away um, most of the time when you stop it. Uh, the other one is renal impairment, and it's advised to check renal status, um, and I usually do that before we start someone on a 5-ASA, uh, and I would generally want it to be checked about every six months to a year. Um, blood dyscrasia is a rare, but, um, and, and, um, and, you know, that's something to be aware of. So if you ever get a patient with uh, bruising or bleeding um, and you think, you know, what's going on here, this is a bit unusual, and they're on a 5-ASA, then it could be uh, related to that. Corticosteroids, I'm sure you guys are very familiar with from uh, lots of other indications, so I won't uh, bore you too much with the details. Other than these side effects, which I've already mentioned, are really important for the, for the long-term results and how these patients' uh, health goes over the course of their life, cataracts, um, cardiovascular risks. Um, a lot of our patients with inflammatory bowel disease are young women, and so things such as acne and weight gain and, um, uh, you know, in psychiatric problems, you know, people can get manic on steroids, as I'm sure you know, and, and find it difficult sleeping. And so often those are the side effects that um, my patients say, look, I never want prednisone again, which I, I can completely uh, understand. Um, sometimes we use um, another type of steroid called budesonide, uh, which is a, a steroid that uh, has a very high hepatic first pass metabolism. So, so 80 to 90 percent of the drug is metabolized in the liver, uh, and so it deposits itself in the gut, and then most of it gets cleared by the liver. So the systemic side effects aren't so much. So, and some of my patients who are very reluctant to go back on steroids if they are having a, a severe flare, uh, then sometimes I'll give them um, budesonide as another type of steroid. Uh, formulation. And then stepping up to the immunomodulators, azathioprine is, is probably the commonest one that you guys will see uh, being used in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. Um, it's a, a drug that in about 10% of patients can cause quite severe nausea uh, and um, about 10% of patients just there's no way they can tolerate. They take a few doses and they, they do really feel awful. We can do a gene test prior to starting which does predict some of the other um, risks because it tells you a bit about the drug's metabolism uh, and those other risks are things like uh, hepatitis again like 5 ASAs uh, and bone marrow suppression and so if you've got a patient who comes in who's on azathioprine for whatever reason uh, and they come in with, with a cough or a cold or you know something like that it's always good to be sure that their white cell count is normal uh, and so a full blood count I think is reasonable anyone who has any sort of infectious um, cause uh, any sort of infectious presentation in your practices uh, to see what the white cell count uh, is doing and if it's low then uh, obviously you've got a problem and we'd take them off the azathioprine. We, we would generally monitor someone on azathioprine every six to eight weeks with regular blood tests to try and uh, predict this. It's an idiosyncratic reaction that can occur at any time and so even if the person's been on azathioprine for a long period of time it doesn't necessarily mean that they're out of the woods and that they're going to you know, not get these uh, hepatitis or these um, all these um, uh, blood uh, bone marrow suppressions. So infliximab is this infusion, it's a, a, a monoclonal antibody and it's directed at the um, conductor of the orchestra who's sort of orchestrating this inflammatory response within the lining of the gut uh, and it basically blocks the uh, TNF alpha and, and stops it working. The main thing to be aware of with infliximab um, and alumab is uh, reactivation of infections and so we do a screen uh, for infections prior to um, you know prior to starting the medication particularly things such as uh, latent TB um, just to make sure that you're not going to reactivate something which uh, could then be very very difficult to treat if it got out of control um, and then adalumumab is the injection um, which is a slightly different uh, antibody which you don't need to know too much about except it's more convenient for the patients because they don't have to come to hospital for an infusion and they give it as an injection. 
Um, right, so let's talk about um, some novel uh, treatments. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard about um, fecal transplants. Uh, it's something that really came uh, originally along for treating uh, C. diff. And we've treated, uh, I think it's about four patients at Middlemore now um, with fecal transplants. And um, what, what basically happens is uh, they find a donor and then the, um, the feces is uh, mixed up and then placed inside the, the colon, usually uh, with, a, um, uh, with some sort of sigmoidoscope. Uh, in some places, not in New Zealand, they do wash the stuff in at the time of colonoscopy. Um, there's actually a, a guy in Canada who has started a business selling what he calls crapsules, spelled C-R-A-P-S-U-L-E-S, believe it or not. And he gets people in his lab to be the donors, and they put these things into a, a capsule form, which uh, is then sold on the internet. Uh, so it's a pretty um, interesting uh, environment out there. Um, but it does work for C. diff. In fact, it's very effective. The patients that I've uh, seen have it. Um, being a smart gastroenterologist, I asked the infectious diseases physicians to do this as opposed to doing it in our department. They bought a blender, which they um, use solely for this purpose, not for making their morning tea. Uh, and, um, and we've had good success in treating C. diff. Now, there are people who are looking at using this for um, irritable bowel syndrome, which I think uh, is, a, is a can of worms. Uh, because uh, we just don't know the long-term effects of, of fecal transplants. And a lot of these people are young. Um, we do know that the microbiota is a very important component of, um, you know, of some of these conditions. And so, you know, maybe in the future when we understand a bit more about the makeup of the bacteria in the colon and, and which particular bacteria are important, uh, maybe, you know, there will be some uh, use in these things for things such as irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, but there have been a few cautionary tales uh, regarding um, fecal transplant. There was a a, um, a case in the UK where uh, there was a um, uh, a lady who uh, was morbidly obese, and her daughter had irritable bowel syndrome. And the daughter was a, a normal sized thin uh, woman. She just had uh, an, an irritable bowel, and she did a donation from her mother. And interestingly enough, uh, she then suddenly started to become obese, which she'd never come before. And so there, all these questions were raised about you know, do the microbiota have some role in, you know, coordinating um, absorption of you know, the food and the, the, the transit, perhaps, of the um, of the bowel, etc. And so we don't yet understand what doing these transplants um, transplants do. And so I do try and discourage my irritable bowel patients from going across to Sydney because there's a clinic over there that are, that's offering this to, to patients uh, because we don't yet know the long term effects of it. Uh, as far as inflammatory bowel disease goes, there's been a couple of um, randomised trials where they either put in a, the faecal transplant or, or uh, just water, and the patients were blinded whether that uh, would, what, to what they were getting. Uh, and the trials have had quite um, disparate results, with one not showing a lot of effect uh, from the faecal transplant, but the other showing quite a strong effect. And if you look into the details of that trial, they actually had six donors, and one of the donors... Um, when that fee, that, those feces were used, there was a 40% response, uh, and that's remission in patients with uh, inflammatory bowel disease, whereas in the other donors, the rates were of something around 10%. And so there was quite a difference in the response um, depending on who the donor was, which sort of gives you a clue that you know, it's probably either the mix of the bacteria or some specific bacteria that are important, but we yet don't know uh, what that is. And so that's not something we, we're using, but something that um, some people have a lot of interest in. Um, the whipworm is another uh, interesting one. Uh, there's been studies where they've deliberately infested um, patients with whipworm who have uh, Crohn's disease and um, you have about a 70 to 80 percent response, uh, which is again interesting. And what that's how that's actually working, uh, I don't know. Uh, but occasionally I do get patients asking me about that. I think this is another really interesting one: the appendectomy. It's been known for um, you know probably 30 years now uh, that Patients who um, have had an appendectomy uh, have a lower incidence of ulcerative colitis. And so if you take large numbers of patients who've had appendectomies and match them to patients who haven't, the patients who haven't are more likely to get ulcerative colitis. And so that's something that's now being um, studied. There's a, uh, something called the ACUA study, which is in, um, done. There's two arms to it, one in Europe and one in the UK and international. 
Um, and in fact, they've done some of these as part of the trial down in um, Hamilton. So what they're doing is they're taking patients with proctitis because it's thought that that's perhaps the, um, the one that's going to respond the best and actually doing a, an appendectomy on these patients and then following them to see whether they respond. And I've seen some of the preliminary data, which actually looks quite encouraging, which is very interesting. And so it's thought perhaps that the appendix um, does more than we thought it did. Uh, it has a lot of lymphoid tissue in it. And so it is important for, um, for the uh, overall control of the, uh, of the immune system and particularly the immune system uh, within the GI tract. In fact, um, today's it today? it's Tuesday. So I actually sent a patient for an appendectomy today um, for this very indication. So she came up to see me from um, down in Tauranga and really was at her wit's end with terrible proctitis despite lots of medications and lots of side effects from medications. And, you know, what I said to her is, well, look, you know, you've really tried the different medications that there are. Your options now are to have a colectomy you know, or um, you could try an you know, appendectomy um, based on some very early data. Appendectomy is a very safe, easy operation to do. And if it's not effective, then we'll go on and, I guess, do a colectomy on her uh, in the future. But I, I guess we'll see where this uh, ends up. Just before you go on, Alice, yeah. there was one question about the, the whipworm, the worms, and how mm. does it work? What do you do? And does it happen in New Zealand? No, it doesn't happen no. in New Zealand. And, and um, I can't remember exactly the protocols in, in, the, in the studies, but um, I guess they're just ingesting. The worms. Yeah, okay. worms. Fascinating. Mm. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> it's a whole new world. Okay. It <laughs> right. So. I think we'll move on to um, to a case, and you know, one of the things that um, I, I guess is nice about being a, a GP is you guys get to know your patients really well over over a period of time. And in fact, I had a, a medical student sitting in on my clinic uh, today from uh, from the United Kingdom, um, and he wants to be a GP. He's just come over to New Zealand have a bit of a holiday, and it was raining, so he decided to turn up to Middlemore and sit in on my clinic, um, and. What I was sort of talking to him about is the nice, the thing that I like about as a, you know, as a, as a specialist, like about looking after these patients with inflammatory bowel disease, is you actually follow them for, you know, for, for a period of time and you get to see their highs and their lows and, you know, their questions about, you know, things such as fertility and pregnancy and, um, and you really get to know the patients quite well. And, it, and it's, it's a bit like a, um, you know, a bit of a social catch up with some of my patients, which is, you know, really a nice thing to have. So I, I do really enjoy looking after these patients. Um, so I thought what we should do is just perhaps just follow a hypothetical case uh, through some of the ups and downs um, in her life. Uh, so this is Emma. She's an 18-year-old university student. She's got a one-year history of diarrhea and abdominal pain, uh, and she's feeling low in energy. Um, I would imagine that quite a number of people in the audience have seen very similar patients uh, today. It's a very common story. Um, and I guess... You know, when I was trying to think about what um, the most interesting and relevant parts of inflammatory bowel talk uh, are for people uh, predominantly in primary care, I think probably the diagnosis is probably one of the things that you guys may struggle with uh, in the sense that you get a lot of patients who have pretty a pretty pretty common and, you know, symptoms that you you could say, well, it's irritable bowel or you know, the person's under stress or, or whatever. Um, how do you know when you know, when you need to take it a bit further, how do you know who to refer? How do you know, you know, what the um, clues are that this person actually needs a bit more investigation and, and uh, maybe a referral onto someone like me? Because I think the the um, more sort of high-end treatments and things, uh, the patient's going to come back to you and you need to be aware of them and, and what they're on, et cetera, and some of the pitfalls which we've talked about. Uh, but a lot of those decisions, I guess, are made in, in tertiary care. So I guess the first question is, um, what other history um, would you seek? Um, I don't know, Helen, if we should look at, if people want to put something there, any comments we can look at, or I could just keep talking. What do you think? I think start maybe with the history and yeah, go okay. through, because there's a few questions here on um, about confirming diagnosis and tests, yeah. tests that we could possibly be doing. So. Awesome. Okay. So I think with the history, um, the keys are things such as, as, um, uh, as, a, as a red flag. So bleeding uh, is obviously very important. History, uh, weight loss that would be another really important history. Family uh, history of inflammatory bowel disease. Um, as I've already said, only 10 to 20% of people have that, but I guess it's useful if, if they do have a positive family history of that. Um, I think smoking is an interesting one. You know, smokers are more likely to have Crohn's, as I've said. 
you know, but funnily enough with smoking, with ulcerative colitis, it's actually protective against smoking. Sorry, protective against smoking. Smoking is protective against ulcerative colitis. And so a classic presentation of ulcerative colitis is actually someone who smoked for a while and then they've suddenly decided to quit for whatever reason. And the next thing you know, they're coming in with diarrhea and a bit of bleeding and pain. And that's a common presentation of ulcerative colitis. That's another clue. Uh, the other thing I think is useful is, is a, a nocturnal history of diarrhea. So if they're getting up at night. Someone's just come through with it. So oh, well you guys are on to you know, that one. So yeah, that, that's another really uh, helpful thing because you don't get that in irritable bowel. If you're asleep, you're asleep with irritable bowel. Uh, if you're waking up to go to the loo, you've got to think, mm, you know, it may not necessarily be inflammatory bowel disease. You might think of other diagnoses, perhaps in an older person, you know, bowel cancer or whatever. Um, but that's a very useful uh, thing to find as well. There's a question here about whether that includes secondhand smoking, and whether that has a similar effect. Uh, it's not. It's not as uh, significantly yet as it well. Yeah. Yeah. And is non Campylobacter a previ previous Campylobacter? Is it a non risk? No, it's not. Oh, okay. No, no. There, there, there are questions in, in the whole pathogenesis of uh, irritable bowel and whether um, organisms such as Campylobacter or Campylobacter you know, or other sort of infectious agents um, and whether that does predispose, you know, and it's sort of the holy grail to say, well, you know, why does someone actually get these diseases in the first place? And so, you know, people have studied Campylobacter extensively. It's certainly a risk factor for irritable bowel when you get post-infectious irritable bowel common, uh, you know, lead from an infection such as Campylobacter, but it's not thought to be important in your risks for Crohn's or also colitis. Yeah. Um, what about exam findings? I, I think, um, you know, when, you, when you've got a patient who's presenting like this, um, they've got abdominal pain. I mean, you need to, you know, you know, you need to examine their abdomen. It could be an appendicitis. It could be anything else. And so it's important to examine them. And, you know, that would, that would guide you to how urgently they need to go to hospital. If they've got a lot of pain or guarding, et cetera, of course, then you need to, to send them along. Uh, and remember those extra intestinal symptoms that I, that I talked about, if they've got red eyes or, you know, you know, they may not have mentioned that they've got sore joints. And so, you know, um, you know examining them and talking to them about that's important uh, as well. Um, the skin rashes are, are rare, uh, but I guess if you found sore lumps on their shins, then that's another good clue that uh, this could be, you know, something like uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Just one clarification about the sure. nocturnal. Is it nocturnal diarrhea specifically or nocturnal defecation at all? Yeah, at all. I think I think if you're waking up, um, or even waking up with pain, then that would be unusual okay. as well. You know, yeah. if you if you nighttime symptoms. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. If you if you sound asleep and you know, and, you, and something, yeah, you know, the pain has woken them up, then that's another thing that you'd be thinking. Well, that's a little bit odd. You know, mm -hmm. that shouldn't happen in someone who's got you know you know more benign conditions such as a irritable bowel syndrome. Yeah. Yeah. So this is what's one of the questions. So um, the audience is uh, is right onto it. So. What tests would you do? I don't know if anyone wants to be we, brave. We have a question um, that sure. came earlier on about um, fecal calprotectin, the yep. diagnosis. Very good um, I think you'd obviously mentioned some of the full blood count and other basic tests. Is there anyone yeah. else who wants to come up with any other? Yes, yeah, so I, I can talk to those. I think, you know, um, your full blood count, um, CRP, yeah, very, very useful. If, the, if this young girl um, who's got pretty you know, typical symptoms of, of irritable bowel. If she's got a CRP of something up, like 20 or whatever, then you, you'd be thinking, mm, uh, obviously there's something going on here. Uh, so that's a clue. I think the faecal calprotectin is actually a very useful test. Um, I guess the, the problem um, is, is the cost of it, and you, you wouldn't necessarily do it on every 18-year-old student who comes to see you with a bit of a bit of diarrhea and abdominal pain. Um, and so it does depend on your pretest probability, but I think if you've got a negative fecal calprotectin, um, and by that I mean so the range in Auckland is less than 50, uh, then that's incredibly reassuring. You know, it's 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 not impossible, but it's unlikely. So you you know your negative predictive value of of it is 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 very helpful. There's always a grey zone with these tests. If you get somewhere between 50 and in our range, 200, up to 250, now that's a difficult group. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's above 250, then you know that to me is a, a positive, and that really is a clue that you know, that this person has got something more significant going on. So it is a good discriminator uh, when you really are more suspicious perhaps than a lot of the patients that you guys have seen even today with uh, diarrhea and abdominal pain. If you're really worried about them having something more sinister, uh, then 
that would be a reasonable test. Uh, we've got a cost here that's come through and it costs $200 to do a Wellington. $190 in Auckland, yeah. so well, you guys are getting ripped off. <laughs> um, we've had some other options come in, Ferritin. Yes, good, 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 yeah. good one. I think um, Ferritin, as you, I'm sure you guys all know, is an acute phase um, protein as well. And so if you've got a high CRP, you may have an artificially high ferritin. Um, an 18-year-old university student um, could well have a low ferritin from menorrhagia or, you know, or dietary related or whatever. So you need to put it in the context of that. Um, but again, you know, if, if you've got no really good reason why, you know, let's say she did have a low ferritin um, and she's got this, these symptoms which I've got there, um, again, that might be a reasonable time to do calprotectin. Uh, spend your two hundred dollars down in Wellington, your hundred ninety up here, and say, well, you know, is this just her periods, which she says says, you know, maybe a bit heavy, but hard to quantify. Um, then that might be a useful time to do that as a discriminator. But certainly, ferritin would go down in most patients when they've got um, ongoing bleeding. Mm. We've got um, liver function tests and urea and electrolytes, which are obviously common tests that we we do. Yeah. Are they useful in the setting? Are they something we should be doing? Well, I think I think in, in in this particular case, when you've got abdominal pain and um, things, I, I think that's a, absolutely a reasonable uh, thing to think about. Um, you know, is she dehydrated? How bad is her diarrhea? And it, it's hard in a brief history that I've got there. I put it as one year. You know, it might be different if she's got acute gastroenteritis or something like that. You might worry about her renal function and things. It's not really going to help you with the diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, she's relatively young, and it she'd be pretty unlucky to have PSC or one of the other sort of conditions associated with it at this time in her, in her life. But it's possible, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess it's worth checking. Um, stool samples. Yeah. Should we be doing stool samples? And what should we be mm. specifically looking That's for? That's a great question, I think. Um, I think the thing with stool samples, like any test that we order, um, you have to think about, is this going to actually change your management? Is this going to change what you do? Now, this girl's got a one-year history of diarrhoea. She ain't going to have an infection. Now, Jardia, maybe. You know, maybe if she had a bit more diet, bloating and things, oh, maybe. But most of the time, I don't think stool tests are particularly helpful in this in this group. That's, you know, stool tests for infection. Do, I mean, in terms of stool blood? Yeah. Or do we uh, oh, you mean like a, a macro? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, again, will it change what you do? Mm. Um, our lab up here in Auckland won't um, do a fecal occult blood on mm. this group. Mm. Uh, fecal occult bloods, um, with my other hat on, being you know, being um, involved with the screening in South Auckland, is a screening test for an asymptomatic patient, and I guess it, it wouldn't really change what we do in this context. Yeah. Right, and they only, uh, we've got a couple of things at MSU. To yep, exclude, great. Um, urine infections. Yep, it's a differential. Um, possible abdominal X-ray if they're severe yep. symptoms, and. Um, could she have an HIV infection as the last thing that's come through there with prolonged diarrhea? Yeah, you guys are on to it. Absolutely. So that's certainly another potential, you know, um, cause of it. Um, HIV per se won't cause diarrhea, so she'd have to have AIDS, um, you know, so, yeah, which would, you know, be unusual again uh, in someone this age, but you could, I guess. It's certainly possible. I think the abdominal X-ray is a, a good question. Um, the sort of fair complication of... Um, Inflammatory bowel disease is this mega colon where the colon just keeps distending and distending and eventually perforates. Um, you know, I've been a gastroenterologist back here in New Zealand for 10 years and I've never seen that. You know, so, you know, it must be vanishingly, vanishingly rare. Um, I guess if you're thinking of uh, other things in the differential, you know, an abdominal x ray may be useful. But I guess if you're doing that, you, they might actually be better being referred into hospital for that, that crook. Um, yeah. Um, CX serology. Yeah, so that's a great yeah. question. Yes, and so absolutely. And TSH and um, the possibility of some gyne problem causing these symptoms, I guess, you know, yep. these are something you may you may be looking at after the initial lot of tests um, rather than originally straight on. Yeah, yeah so celiac serology, um, yes, an excellent suggestion. She's had diarrhoea for a year. Um, yeah, she could well be. You know, she may have a slightly low ferritin, as we've talked about, and she, maybe she does have celiac disease. And so I think that is absolutely reasonable. Um, and then gynae causes, yep. Look at the next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so then leading from this case, we've got, we had a question earlier on that said, is, um, you know, say she comes back with 
you know, what we think is a, a great history in an exam and, and positive tests that we think this really fits with inflammatory bowel disease. Yep. Is inflammatory bowel disease possibly a clinical diagnosis or do you always have to have histology to have this as a proper diagnosis? I, I think um, I think you have to have an endoscopy and have a, have a diagnosis because I think if the person has inflammatory bowel disease, um, what I sort of alluded to earlier in the talk is we want to be all over the treatment. You know, we don't want this girl to end up accumulating that damage to the gut over time. And so we need to know what exactly is going on, where the disease is, how severe it is, and get her on the appropriate treatment. I think you can be really suspicious, and that's that's great. You know, um, you know, I think um, you know another another question maybe you know if you were really suspicious, would you put her on prednisone um, or something to, to treat her initially? Um, I think if she was sick enough to to be deemed to need that, she probably should go to hospital. Mm. Um, I think, you know, five ASAs are pretty well tolerated. I guess you could put her on there, you know, but really you're going to need a bit more information and a good diagnosis. And so if you any gastroenterologist, you're welcome to call me. I'm happy to talk to you and arrange things from there. And, you know, um, we grade in our grading um, at Middlemore, which is a regional thing if we're very suspicious of inflammatory bowel disease they'll get a p1 and so we die you know we should get these people in pretty quickly within you know, you know a few weeks a week to two weeks maximum for a colonoscopy or, or at least an assessment okay yeah. great shall we move forward why not oh yeah okay so look we did a cup fecal cup yeah. it was 310 so that's up so as i said you know uh, i haven't made it great cause it was too hard to talk to so i've said it's over 250 which um which is a positive fecal cow protected um and so you know what would you do now um she probably needs a referral i think mm. this girl sort of alluded to that because we really want to know what's going on you know lots of you know if this isn't bowel disease you know what you know, what, what are we dealing with here? yeah Yep, and I think that's what's come through, you know, when is it appropriate to refer? So in this setting where mm. you've clearly got a, a raised test and you've got symptoms in exam that fit the bill, then yeah. that's, that's a clear-cut referral. I guess yes, there'll be is. ones that are, are not, not so clear-cut, but then a referral for, to help with diagnosis is appropriate. Absolutely, yeah. And I think, um, I mean, we know that you guys see lots and lots and lots of patients that you don't refer and so I know that when you guys do refer one, it's someone, for whatever reason, you're a bit more concerned about. And so I don't have a problem with seeing any patient that, um, that a GP's seen and, you know, and thinks, well, you know, it might not be, it may only, only be irritable bowel and I could help them manage it, you know, with diet or whatever. But, you know, I understand that if you guys are concerned, then refer them in and, and you know, most of your gastroenterologists around the traps will be happy to, to see them. Mm. Would you, um, with the... So with that sort of grey area of the, mm. the faecal cow protectin, would you consider retesting it before referral or would you just go straight ahead and say, hey, look, this is this is within a grey area, this person may be suffering and start the referral process. For instance. Yeah. Is it worth repeating these tests? Well, probably probably not unless the symptoms are worsening. Okay. You know, you're probably just going to get a similar sort of um, result. Um, and I guess, you know, all of these tests have to be taken in the context of the rest of the information that you've got and you know from your history and examination and your other blood tests and things and yeah. I, and it comes down to if you're worried you know i'm not going to say no if you refer me a person with a low fecal cow protectin if you you know if you've got other reasons why you think you know from your clinical impression that this person needs you know, further investigation then, you know it's very difficult to put a rule on on that i think yeah yeah is it necessary do you have to have one of these before we refer to you. A cow protectin? Yeah. No, definitely not. Okay. No. Brilliant. Um, and, oh, sorry, the last thing here, can a prolonged gastroenteritis cause an ele yes. elevation? Yes. Yeah, so yes. your fecal cow protectin can go up with other things, and that, that's where it you know, does get a bit tricky. If the person's yeah. taking a lot of on steroids for their knee pain or whatever, yeah. you know, which they do when you think, oh, it's an arthritis and inflammatory bowel disease, et cetera. But, again, you're not going to know until you're, you know, until you look and so other things do put it up infections medications etc uh sometimes you get false positives you know yeah. they're up and the, you know we do a colonoscopy and it's completely normal yeah. you know, so it does happen as well yeah all right all right yep all right so she did get referred in um and this is what we found on the colonoscopy uh this is a deep linear ulcer um in the colon um so she's got crohn's disease uh, so this is a new diagnosis. 
Um, and you know, what I've talked about a little bit before was, was actually working out where the disease is, which is important for what we would treat her. Um, you know, she had some terminal ileal ulceration and a bit of colonic disease in this case. Um, and so I guess the question that now is what treatment would be appropriate. Now, you'd expect this decision to be made by the person who's done the endoscopy. And um, but this is just to sort of give you an indication of where we head. Probably in someone like her, if the disease was sort of mild to moderate, uh, I would put her on uh, a five ASA. Um, I would try and avoid prednisone in a young woman like this. Um, she doesn't sound like she's particularly sick, um, and so it might be appropriate to put her on Contagia and, and see how she responds to that and give her some time. So she's on Pentaza. Uh, what monitoring is required? I've sort of alluded to this. We check her renal function. And, uh, liver tests and things, mm -hmm. um, you know. But someone like her, um, I'd be getting her to come back and see me fairly frequently in clinic, yeah. uh, at least initially, uh, to keep an eye on, um, to make sure that she's settling down. Because I want this inflammation to go away. I want her disease to be well controlled, so she doesn't end up with uh, complications over her life. Sorry, I've got a question saying sure. where, where on the photo um, can you see the deep linear ulcer? I, Is it the I... white ceiling? I think you can see. Can oh, see you the... can see the mouse. If you can see my mouse, the, this thing here is a is a is an ulcer. So this is the swollen edematous boggy mucosa, and up here as well. And then this thing here is where the mucosa has sort of been eroded away. So and, that's the white. And the white um, stuff is just yeah. is just the sort of muck sitting on top. Yeah. Of it. Yeah. Um, so if you think about a mouth ulcer in your own mouth, which you've probably yeah. had one at some point, it's an erosion like that with a little sort of white plaque that sits over it. So it's yeah. there and it's all up in here. So this yeah. is a quite an extensive area of ulceration, probably just up here a little bit mm. as well in that picture. So that that's what we're seeing there. Yeah. Mm. And if um, the calprotectin is high, but the mm. colonoscopy is negative, are you still thinking about something like Crohn's or Skies are onto. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that um, again, that would depend on your uh, clinical suspicion. Um, and I think in that situation, I mean, one of the problems with pill cam is it's a very expensive you know, resource. We charge around $3,000 in private. The capsules themselves are about $1,200. Um, and so we're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna just do pill cams, I, I guess, on too many people. But, you know, in someone like her with a high fecal cow protecting, if she's got ongoing symptoms and you had a normal colonoscopy, I probably would go ahead and do the colonoscopy because I wanna be sure that we're not missing Crohn's. And, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, doing, I'm doing a lot of capsule endoscopy at the moment. I probably, I probably do at least five a week. And I would see two or three patients a year who've had 20 years of miserable, irritable bowel. You do a pill chem and they've got terrible Crohn's disease, you know, and you know, a lot of them have seen psychiatrists and all sorts of things because oh. they've had a miserable life. You know, so you do see it, you know, and so we do, I think we have missed a lot of, you know, small bowel Crohn's historically when we haven't had the ability to. That's right, to it's lock. been difficult to diagnose, yeah, very, isn't it? So, yeah. Hmm, yeah. Yeah, yes, yeah, so that's a good question. Okay, uh, let's move forward for a little bit and see what happens. Um, oh, I'm contradicting myself here, so maybe it wasn't me looking out. Someone gave us some prednisone <laughs> <laughs> in my hypothetical case. Um, and if we were giving someone like her prednisone, we would try, try and give her as short a course as possible, reducing, you know, as you guys would know. What kind of dose um, do you start with the oh, ALST? Because I think we're, that's something that we as GPs are fairly fearful of prednisone or steroids in general. So I, I would I would put her put her put her on forty. Yeah. Okay. You know, unless yeah. she was a very very small tiny lady. Yeah. Um, you know, but most people you'd put on forty, and, and I'd try and drop it. You know, for someone like her whose disease, I mean, if the disease isn't too bad, I'd actually. Chop it quite quickly. I'd quickly, mm -hmm. I drop about ten a week and try mm -hmm. and get her off it. Yeah, you know, in, a, in a month or so, and as quick as possible. Okay. Um, we find, you know, in people on prednisone, it's somewhere between ten and twenty milligrams that they often get a bit worse. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's the sort of time. So if I'm arranging a follow up for a patient, I'll often think about the way I'm reducing the prednisone and actually try and follow them when they're around that dose. Yeah. And so you can troubleshoot it there. And sometimes you just need to press on another week or so on that dose. Or just a little bit longer and then drop it again and so that's a reasonable approach you know if you've got a person who was sort of getting heaps better and they got a little bit worse around that sort of 10 15 maybe mm. level mm. you might just give them a little bit longer at that dose and then come off it from there um, yeah okay so her life carries on she gets better she has 18 months of good control takes her Pentaza uh, does well now she comes to see you and she wants to go off trailer. 
what would you advise? I mean, this is common, isn't it, in this age group? Um, I think, um, you know, there's absolutely no reason why she couldn't go treatment. You know, uh, of course, she's done really well. She's had 18 months. You know, originally, her disease wasn't too bad. Um, often with these patients, particularly if they're compliant and, you know, people who you, you know, think are you know, sensible, um, I would give them some prednisone to take with them, you know, because I guess the worst case scenario is she's in deepest, darkest Africa or somewhere and she starts to get a terrible flare, you know, and I think giving her some instructions a bit, you know, like an action plan with your asthma asthma patients, you know, so she's got an idea of, you know, where, you know, you know if she should take it. The caveat on that, obviously, is she's, you know, these young people who are travelling are likely to pick up a gastroenteritis, so you've got to be sure she's not going to take it for that, and so you tell her, like, if she had diarrhea for sort of more than three or four days, it was particularly bad, and, you know, and often once they've had one flare, they sort of know what another one's like as well, um, you know, and so I think that's absolutely, absolutely fine. Um, there is some risk if she got a gastroenteritis illness. Um, there is a chance, it's been shown that it does slightly increase your risk of a flare, you know, so just, you know, she should try and be careful with what she eats, etc. but, you know, she's probably 19 years old now, you're probably not going to have much luck telling her to be careful. That sounds good. <laughs> yeah. We've had um, actually one thing. How common would it be to find an inflammatory bowel disease with a normal CRP and full blood count? So if she didn't have all these race tests? Yeah, it's it's, it's actually pretty common. Um, yeah, maybe 5 to 10% of, of patients. Mm. Um, but interestingly, um, history repeats itself. Mm. And so... If you've had a patient who's had a flare with a high CRP, if they have another flare in the future, they're going to have a high CRP most likely, and the, and the vice versa of that. If you've had a patient who you know has had a bad flare like her, we've locked, she's got Crohn's, if her CRP was plum normal at that time, she may be one that doesn't have one in the future. So it's helpful to be aware of that, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, someone's got a question about probiotics, so I'm taking the questions. Oh, well done. Yeah, yeah I think just that's popped a, up. Patients uh, love taking them. They do. They absolutely love taking them. So you must see that quite a lot, and we see it quite yep, a lot. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I think um, probiotics are very helpful for, for people with, with diarrhoea, mm. uh, for whatever cause. And you know, one of the things with, um, you know, if you think approximately one in five patients have mm -hmm. irritable bowel, you know, a lot of your patients with inflammatory bowel disease have irritable bowel mm. as well and I think it's sometimes really difficult to know if the person's having you know if some of their symptoms are related to irritable bowel or if they're related to a flare and that's where things like calprotectin and sometimes mm. repeating colonoscopies and things is useful you know because if they're having a lot of symptoms and you do a colonoscopy and it's normal or then calprotectin is normal if you're just doing that um, then that's sort of helpful to say well actually maybe this is more related to your irritable bowel and, and things like probiotics are helpful as you probably know probiotics you know, there is some evidence that it reduces your chance of getting a gastroenteritis when you're traveling so you know, maybe that would be something that would be reasonable. Are there any um, risks with taking them? With probiotics? Mm. Um, there's a big risk to your wallet, I think. <laughs> they're not cheap. Um, no, not, no, I, I'm not aware of any particular risk related to inflammatory bowel disease with taking no. them so I think it's, it's fine if patients want to. Yeah. Um, and there's been a question come through that was something else we, we were going to bring up a little, in a little while. In this age group, obviously, um, the Emma may be taking pregnancy precautions. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you advise, not necessarily when she's travelling, but at any point um, for, for her if she was your patient? Um, well, there's no, I mean, she could have whatever contraception um, you know, she, she requires or wants to use uh, at this point because she's actually really well. Mm. You know, so you should treat this person like a normal, yeah. a normal uh, woman. Um, you know, five ASAs are you know, are okay in pregnancy. Um, Azathioprine's okay in pregnancy. Yeah. Methotrexate clearly isn't. So if she was on that, that would yeah. be different. Um, the biologics like infliximab and adalimumab, um, we think are safe in pregnancy. Generally, we would try and stop. Um, adalimumab, which is also called Humira, in the last trimester. Mm -hmm. um, one of the problems with um, pregnant uh, people with inflammatory bowel disease is, is the risk of the outcome of the pregnancy mm -hmm. and, and um, the risks of a complication of pregnancy in a, a woman with inflammatory bowel disease are, are, are just generally higher, you know, higher risk of preterm birth, higher risk of small you know, growth retardation, etc. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that relates um, more to the disease uh, than the medications. Right, okay. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that um, I would talk to a patient like this if I was looking after her in my clinic, 
I'd be very upfront about pregnancy, etc. right at the very beginning and say, look, the last thing you should do is stop your medications if you get pregnant. Okay. You know, because if you do, you're likely to have a flare and then your baby's actually more at risk than, you know, these theoretical risks associated with something such as azathioprine. And not all women take that on board, you know, it's mm. difficult for them to keep taking a tablet that they know, you know, could have a potential you know, problem. So it's the disease that they they should be focusing on rather than the medication. Yeah. yeah. Someone has just asked you to repeat which which ones were safer in pregnancy. Which one you know would you possibly I, the other way? Which would you stop? I, I, you definitely have to stop methotrexate. Yeah. Um, I think you would carry pretty much everything else on. Yeah. I mean, no one really on psych is born, but you would stop there. But you'd carry pretty much everything else on. Yeah. Um, these people should be under. Um, you know, matern maternity physician, so yeah. you know you need someone like that in a sort of high risk pregnancy mm -hmm. management, and the gastroenterologist should be involved in managing their care because it's not well understood, but the hormonal changes in pregnancy can affect the um, activity of the disease, and so if you get, um, you, you know, you can get women flaring you know, more like more likely in pregnancy and, and some less likely. Yeah, I've heard of the remission. Yeah, yeah, as well. yeah, yeah. I mean, I've got one patient who she's had. Watch you up to six babies now because you feel so good when she's pregnant. <laughs> you know, so for some people it does make a difference That's to right. you know to their you know to their disease. But the, the key is, you know, for, for a healthy pregnancy, it's how well the patient is when they conceive. You know, and and in fact, if they've got really terrible disease, their fertility rates go do go down, so they're less likely to to actually get pregnant if they are uh, if they're having you know, out of control disease. Um, but if they do, then they're likely to get a lot worse. And so you want to get them as well as you can mm -hmm. in a sort of an organised way, if possible, yeah. before they plan a family. And for if she if she's taking the the contraceptive pill, is there any reaction amongst any of the medications with the contraceptive pill? So no, that's okay. Yeah, so yeah. she's she's pretty well protected with usual. Yep. Yep. Um, I have had one question, sorry, just come through that's that moving on from that about mm -hmm. um, is there any reason to switch a patient between Pentasa to Aspol or vice versa? Um, it, it really depends on the distribution of the disease. Uh, so azacol is predominantly for colonic disease just because of the way that it's um, designed and the way that it's distributed, mm -hmm. uh, whereas we predominantly use Pentasa for small bowel and or colonic disease, so it sort of treats everything. Um, patients do find azacol a little bit easier to take um, just because of the way the capsules are. Um, you know, but, it, you know, there's no... The, the, you know, other than the distribution of the disease, perhaps it was started on one and you realise it's, you know, slightly different to what you thought. Yeah. You might have thought it was osculitis now it turns out to be Crohn's. You might yeah. switch them in that case. Yeah. You know, but no, I don't think there's any sort of clinical indication to switch them if you think one's not working. You need an escalation of therapy. And I'd put the five ASAs as a group yeah. on one level. Yeah. Um, yeah. Brilliant. Hmm. All right. And are all probiotics equal? Do you know? I don't think anyone no, really know knows that, that question. That's, I good, think. that's a really good question. I think impossible. there's something called VSL3, so Victor Sierra Lena 3, which is the only one that's got any data around it. And that's not really available in New Zealand. I get patients who buy it online. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the better one. It's just that that's the one that they've done the studies on. And I don't think, you know, what we can get here is is a whole mixture of things. And, mm -hmm. You know, and we don't yet know which probiotics are the really important ones, whether it's the amount, you know, whether it's the ratios of the bacteria. And in fact, the other thing is it may actually be different for different people. Yeah. And we don't yet know that either. So no, I don't I don't actually strongly advise any particular probiotic. All I say to the patient is they've actually really got to think about the cost of them because yeah. I think if you're buying the Blackmores ones or something like that, you may be paying a lot more than buying some yogurt from the supermarket. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, and someone's come through on the back of that saying, are, are they safe enough to take in the context of immunosuppressive medication when there's no, yeah. no obvious no risk with taking the yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, let's carry on with Emma. Okay. Amount. So Emma, what happens now? She comes back from her lovely holidays. Now she's 21 years old. Um, and unfortunately she gets worse. So she starts to have a, a severe flare. And she remembers that prednisone course that she got when she was a bit younger and what it did to her. So she refuses to take prednisone, which, you know, might be reasonable. Um, you know, what would you do now? And I think, you know, clearly, if she's having a severe flare, you know, she needs to be seen by her gastroenterologist or whoever's looking after her. And, and you know, she's going to need an escalation of therapy, you know. And what I sort of tried to say a bit earlier is in my practice, I'm very aggressive, actually, in trying to get these people on treatment a bit earlier. And, 
you know, it's not really demonstrated particularly well by this case, but, you know, I would want to know that a person like her has the disease under control, you know, and so I might have done another colonoscopy a little bit earlier than now, although it's only three years. It depends on how she's been. She's been quite well, so it might be, you could argue it either way, I guess, but I want to know that her disease is controlled. Yeah. You know, clearly now she's got more symptoms, she's feeling worse, and so she needs an escalation of therapy, and I'd probably put her on to... Um, as a thiobrin, which is terrible spelling there, but anyway, that so I'd, I'd put it onto that now and um, and think about even going up to biologics if she didn't respond. Yeah, yeah. Okay. and you'd monitor that by endoscopies and, and obviously monitoring the clinical picture. Yeah, um, we sort of mentioned pregnancy I yeah. think, as well, but you know this is a really common sort of you know, progression through this girl's mm. life of exactly what we see. Mm. Um, so I would clearly say now, you know, that she's 24, you're, she's on Humira and has a thiopin, mm. please keep going with those medications and we'd look at stopping the Humira in your, in your last trimester. And the reason for that is there is some concern about, you know, what gets passed on to the fetus mm. and whether that's, you know, whether that's significant or not, we actually really don't know. And, mm. and the other question around that is, uh, are there problems with vaccinations and, you know, in the newborns and, you know, you've got to be a bit careful with live vaccines, et cetera. Um, you know, babies potentially being exposed to Humira. So we would generally stop in the final trimester because she'll probably be fine for that trimester and we'd restart it again. Fortunately, it doesn't, you know, get into the breast milk so they can breastfeed. Yeah. yeah. There was a question that came on the back of the, the um, contraceptive pill still being concerned about it not mm. being as effective related to the diarrhoea rather than medication. And I see, yeah. When you're coming to that, I guess. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know, honestly, I don't know any data on that. Yeah. Um, I would be surprised. I don't think it would affect your absorption, yep. you know, to that yeah. extent. Okay. Yeah. Um, and a couple of questions with the flare around the medication. So in case of a flare, is mesalazine dose increase the first thing that we should be doing and how much should we that's be giving? Great, yeah, it's a great question. So, yeah, it's a really good idea. So that's right. So the studies show that if you go below three grams, um, you know, as your daily dose, and most people don't split the dose now because the compliance is better if you just take it all at one time. Mm -hmm. um, you could certainly push that up to four grams. Yeah. Um, and there is data to show that that will increase your chance of response. Um, not in this case, but if the person had, you know, rectal disease or something that you can get at, you know, you could give suppositories or enemas, mm -hmm. you know, to treat the local disease. If You know, if her main symptom is diarrhea and she's got, proctitis or you know Crohn's low down or something like that then coliform enemas um, yeah contains enemas and things you know the local treatment's actually important as well so those are things you could institute you know in, in, in primary care um, so higher put up the dose of you know, yeah, pentasa and, and treat them rectally if they've got this known disease down there yeah yeah and is pentasa just as good for Crohn's as it is, as it is for ulcerative colitis yeah so if you're using it topically like rectally like that so it should be absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. Because it's it's again it's a different formulation. So it's still a five A, so it's still going to work. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, do you cover for methotrexate induced toxicity with folic acid five milligrams once a week? Yes, definitely. Okay, because there's something on here about it being an unimproved um, indication for for having it, um, but that that's what they would recommend. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Brilliant. Anything more for Emma? Oh, oh yeah. There we go. Oh yeah. Okay. So she's getting a bit older. She's 28. Um, so what screening would you advise? Um, well, I think I mean that, I put that in really, you know, around around the risk of bowel cancer, you know, because we know that you know patients who um, have had the disease for a you know a longer period of time, you know, and, and what I'm talking about here is colitis, you know, so not small bowel disease, etc. Then we should start you know screening them. Their mm -hmm. colon. So they've got extensive colitis, somewhere between eight, I usually start at eight years, but eight to ten years is when you should start uh, screening every couple of years. Okay. If the person's got um, PSC, so this primary sclerosing cholangitis, which is an associated disease with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's, then their risk of bowel cancer is actually really, really high. So those are ones that we do every year, we do a colonoscopy on them. From diagnosis every year? No, once I've had it for eight okay. years, yeah. And um, the other thing to think about and her um, being now on azathioprine for a number of years and Humira is just keeping an eye on her skin, mm -hmm. you know, skin cancers and things like that. You know, the risk is increased, you know, with 
you know, with these biologics, you know, if she's a, a European fair skinned um like yourself, yeah. you know, I would be I would be you know, screening. Yeah, I'd be really careful we're you know, looking, you know, getting getting someone to actually keep an eye on the skin. Uh, so those would be the main things I think. Um you know, diet's an interesting one, I think. Um there's no specific diet that's proven for inflammatory bowel disease. If someone's got um you know in the pediatric population um the, the kids get put on elemental diets um which is basically yeah. eating only for sip yeah you know and adults really can't cope with that for too long yeah. uh, but it does work you know and, and studies have shown it's almost as effective as steroids you know for getting remission and very occasionally we do that in an adult and we're really struggling to get them well uh, but that's pretty extreme mm -hmm. if a person's got a known stricture um and they're getting obstructive type symptoms then um Low residue diets, you know, would be avoiding, you know, broccolis and pips and seeds and things, things like that that you know are potentially going to get stuck. Um, a lot of patients, as I've already said, have irritable bowel, and so you know, I do spend time talking about the FODMAP diets and things, which is a, you know, which is helpful still for their yeah. for their irritable bowel symptoms as part of their, you know, as part of their overall well-being. So that's something that I do often talk to patients about. And you mentioned before the nutritional deficiencies that you want yep, to be absolutely. careful about. So. Absolutely. So you're right. That's another thing to think yeah. about. Um, someone said, does aloe vera juice have any role? Um, I think, I mean, aloe vera juice um, doesn't have a whole lot of great evidence for you know for it. Yeah. Um, but you get the occasional patient who takes it and, you know, whether it's placebo or more than that, I don't know. But I certainly don't tell people to stop it if they're taking it and they're finding it helps. You yeah. know, that's, okay. that's absolutely fine. It's certainly not going to do them any harm. Mm, okay. yeah. um, and say Emma had celiac disease rather than inflammatory bowel disease, yep. um, should should she be receiving routine surveillance with regards to a cancer risk? <laughs> Which is a controversial question, it's I imagine. Good question. Yeah. You know, the risk of um, bowel cancer goes up about double in people with celiac disease, but it's thought that if the celiac disease is well controlled, then that probably comes back to baseline. You know, So providing that they're on their gluten-free diet and they're doing okay, um, you know, then I wouldn't necessarily continue screening them. It might be reasonable to do it, you know, as part of screening when they're 50 or 55 or something like that. But but no, I wouldn't routinely screen them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is there any known association with occupational disease? And the other question I had earlier was um, just, you know, what risk, do we have known risk factors or um, yeah, environmental risk factors that we should be thinking about for inflammatory bowel disease? Yeah, there's actually no evidence on that. Right. Okay. Exactly. I think there's a lot of discussion and, and theories and things, and you know, you know, is it what's getting put into our food? You know, you know, even things like you know, if you're swallowing your toothpaste, you know, is it, you know, is there something in that? And but, you know, we just don't know. Okay. As far as occupational risks go, there's no particular known risks for for developing it. So it's still really not that well understood. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I've got one last question here, which is switching from cortisone to budesonide. Can it be done at any time and are there any precautions? Um, yes, it can be done at any time. And I guess the, the thing with the budesonide, as I've already said, is a, a great medicine in that acute you know, and well person who's got, has had side effects from, you know, from previous prednisone and things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it is a medicine that I, you know, that I that I use fairly frequently. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but I think in primary care, if you if you're sort of asking those questions, you've you've really got to think. Well, you know, yeah. do we need to get this person a bit a bit more of an assessment? You know, what's actually going on? You know, are we treating irritable bowel when we think it's inflammatory bowel? You know, do they need another mm -hmm. investigation, another colonoscopy? Because I think if you're starting to think around. You know, those sorts of issues, then that's probably more of a longer term management question. Right. Put them on as a thiopril or, or something more. Yeah. 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 Great. I think that's. Oh, no. I'm um, sorry. One more question and then that is it. Um, what, is, what is your first line choice of drug in any age? I guess it depends more Do you on. Do mean for inflammatory policy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. um, yeah, it depends. On, it's a good presentation. Oh, it's a difficult question, I suppose, because it's quite broad, isn't it? Yeah, it depends on how they present. Yeah. Um, Probably the answer would be a 5 ASA, hmm. you know, if you took all comers, um, you know, because it's a, a, a safe, you know, well tolerated in most people. Um, but as I've already said, what you don't want to do is under treat these people nowadays because you don't want to leave them to 
collect all of these you know complications over time so you know i think 5 ASA would probably be the answer to that but you really need to be sure that it's enough okay yeah depending on the severity of your disease okay and i do have someone coming up with that about crohn's presenting with recurrent mouth ulcers so yep. that's a non absolutely yeah, yeah. so yeah. i mean your mouth is part of your gi tract and so yes. it's the same sort of yeah. Um, someone also asked, I think, right at the very beginning, why we should be avoiding anti-inflammatories, which I think is obviously related to the effect on the bowel, but can you explain a bit further? Yeah, um, it, it does slightly increase your risk of a flare, mm. is the basic answer. Yeah. You know, it's a difficult one because as you uh, guys all know, anti-inflammatories are great medicines for, for pain. And, and I think, I, I wouldn't say absolutely, definitely don't, you know, but just be aware that you know, if these people are taking them and taking them in big doses for a period of time, then you know there is a chance that it's going to exacerbate things. The other thing from an endoscopist's uh, perspective is, if you're giving them lots of anti-inflammatories, and I have a look inside and there's ulcers, I don't necessarily know it's Crohn's, mm -hmm. the fear of their Crohn's, and so sometimes it does make it difficult to know, you know what whether it's a disease or whether it's the anti-inflammatories causing the ulcers, because we see lots of colonic ulcers with anti-inflammatories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, thank you, Alistair. Thank you. And we've had lots of great questions and great response. So I really appreciate your time. No problem at all. Um, we had, oh, back the other way. We That's your centre in the Barry Centre yep. in Auckland. Um, we have the next webinar, which I think is here, is Safety and Practice to Reduce Patient Harm by Dr. Neil Houston. And that's on Tuesday, February the 27th. Um, should be a really interesting session, I think, a topic that we don't know too much about and we probably should know more. So looking forward to seeing you then. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.